Uprooted Theatrical Studios presents Ninety-five was at the peak of the Bosnian War and I just was um, beside myself with a desire to do something as an artist to, to address that. And I got this amazing grant from Lila Wallace uh, Fund which had to do with bringing my work as a playwright into a, a community that might be served by it and, and who were underserved as, as in, in terms of the arts, and the theater in particular. And so I got money to help me put together a production of a reading of My Trojan Women, which I wrote specifically for refugees from the former Yugoslavia. And I multiple cast it so that there were never fewer than two people playing each part. And, um, and I had them translate all of their parts into their own language, their own translations into Serbo Croatian. Um, and sometimes they'd speak it in English and sometimes they'd speak it in their own language. But the idea being that if you only spoke English, you could understand the entire play. And if you only spoke Serbo Croatian, you could understand the entire play. And there was always this sense of the languages sort of layering on top of each other. And so the, what I found was the sort of, the thing that all of these women had in common, all of these people had in common, because they're men in the play as well, was that they'd all lost their homeland. They'd all lost their city. Whether it was intact or not, the, the country was never gonna be the same country as the one that they grew up in. And what I found when we did our first you know, rehearsals, we would sit around in a circle, and these were people who would have crossed the street to avoid each other ordinarily because this was, you know, these were people who had, until very recently, been at war with each other and lost um, family members and friends to each other. Um, but I cast them so that there were people from different sides of the conflict often sharing the same part, which was really tough. It was really tough. And they dealt with it as well as anybody could have imagined they would. But we'd sit in a circle, all of us, and we had translators, but we also, um, everybody spoke enough English to, to make themselves understood and to basically understand what was going on. But I asked them to close their eyes and to think back on a time when they were really happy in the village that they came from or the city that they came from and think back on a part of the city or the village that they, they had really loved when they were a kid and to just share with us where they were standing or where they were sitting. And it had to be a public place, a public uh, uh, area. And so we sat with our eyes closed and just went around this circle and one woman, one person after another said, I'm standing on the corner of this street and that street, and I'm across, this, I'm across the street from my uncle's candy shop, and I'm holding the coin that I'm going to use to buy this particular candy, and I'm about to run across the street. And the next person would say, I'm, I'm sailing a kite on the balustrade overlooking this, you know. It was just this beautiful, beautiful thing. And realizing that for me, the Trojan women, in my version of it, is about homesickness. It's about homesickness for a home that you miss even as you're standing in it. You know, you, that, you look, that you're, your home doesn't exist anymore even though you're there. You will, all, you will be exiles for the rest of your life. Um, it's a play about, you know, the agony of exile and of losing a homeland. So it ended up being an extraordinary experience for all of us. And I've never been more proud of 
the people who participated because they were people who managed to get past these extraordinary uh, enmities and find a way to work together, to stand on a stage together and actually participate in making sense of the same character, going through the same emotional arc with somebody you would consider your enemy in any other time. And it made friends of people who just did not expect that to happen. <laughs> I mean, did not expect to ever be able to even speak civilly to each other. And they were, you know, embracing and weeping <laughs> what they'd experienced together by the end of it. I'm just taking like a moment to just soak in just like every single thing you said. I just... I would have just loved to have been in that room. It, it was remarkable. I mean, there were two women. One was um, a woman who had gone through absolute hell. She was a Bosnian who had seen a lot of her family killed in front of her. And she was, I put her, because I thought she was such an extraordinary person, I had her play one of the Andromaches, which is the big, you know, tragic character in, in the play. I mean, yeah. of all of the characters, she's the one who really, she goes through this huge uh, tragic arc. And I cast her with a Serbian woman who was, um, you know, an activist for peace and an artist. And she was the only person I ever worked with in that company. I did it three times, three years in a row with different groups of uh, uh, Yugoslav people. And I paired these two women together and uh, it was all, it was a really difficult thing for both of them because they were so tense with each other. Yeah. And finally there was a period where they were, I had them all, all of the major characters in different dressing rooms in this little theater downtown, a classic stage company on 13th Street. And um, I put the Andromaches into one dressing room and I basically said, you know, just go through your part together. And then all of a sudden I heard these screaming and like yelling coming from this one uh, um, dressing room and it was the Andromaches and I just thought oh god oh god and I would I did the whole project with a psychiatric social worker who had spent some time in Yugoslavia and I turned to her and I said what do I do and she said maybe they'll work it out don't don't feel like you have to intervene maybe they'll work it out so we waited for a while until it was just crying it wasn't screaming anymore and I went in and I said, look, I don't know what's happened here, but it doesn't really matter. Why don't you just leave and go get something to eat? Just take a break. Just leave the theater and, you know, take a break and come back when you're ready. And I thought, I'll never see them again. <laughs> because, you know, that did happen. I mean, people would go away and they just couldn't take it. It was really, really hard. And they came back a few hours later and they were holding hands. And they had worked it out. And, you know, I'll never get over that. And I, I still thought it was a little dicey, like, oh, God, how long is this going to last? Okay. But, of course, you know, the, the Bosnian woman had basically said, I can't even hear the sound of your dialect, you know, the Serbian dialect, because that's the sound of the people who killed my family. And the Serbs said, I didn't kill your family. You know, the last time I was in Belgrade was to protest Milosevic. I did not kill your family. You're going to have to accept the fact that some of us um, are not your enemy. And, but I went back after, before the, the performance, and everybody was very nervous about the performance. And I saw the Serb cradling... <laughs> The, the Bosnian woman and singing a lullaby to her because she was so freaked out about going on stage. And, you know, the star was singing this lullaby in Yugoslavia. And, you know, they went on stage and they did this beautiful job. And at the end of it, everybody smoked. I mean, that was the thing. They were all 
smokers. And so we had to take breaks all the time for everybody to smoke. But after the production, we, I was standing next to the Bosnian woman and we were smoking. And the Serbian woman was walking by and the Bosnian woman said, offered her a cigarette. Huge, huge deal because the ritual is if you offer somebody a cigarette and they accept the cigarette, you have to stand there and smoke together. You don't just sort of take a cigarette and go away. It's a whole social thing. So she was inviting her to stand there and smoke with us. And as we were smoking, the, the Bosnian woman said to the Serb, you are a great actress. And she said it in English, so for me, I think, as much as for, for her. But she said, you're a great actress. It was a privilege to be on stage with you. And I just, I, uh, I'll never get over that. I will never get over that. So I, I just developed the theory that really what we should all do at the UN is just put on plays because I think stage fright is, is the great unifying force in the universe. I mean, it was really, <laughs> it was amazing what happened when people were just having to deal with what stage fright is mm -hmm. and the power of sharing that experience with each other. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah, well, you know, the, the play does this thing to you. you mm -hmm. Oh, I just, when, you, when I read the intro, I read your intro first, and then I read the play, and I was just like, in my head, I was just like imagining it from like an audience perspective of just like, what, how does this work? How does, how yeah. do people like this come together and make this beautiful piece of art? And it wasn't, it wasn't easy, but it ended up being maybe the most remarkable thing I've ever been part of. Mm -hmm. We had this thing where, I mean, usually in most rehearsal processes, particularly for Greek plays, you spend the entire time trying to get the actors up to the pitch, the emotional pitch that is required of these huge emotional characters and the, dr the drama that's so outsized. Um, or can feel outsized to, to, you know, little realistic drama us, you know. But the entire rehearsal process for that Trojan Women was about getting the women to move their emotion down far enough that they could get through it without weeping, you know, okay. controllably. But we did have this um, system, which was if you were reading and you couldn't stop crying. You had a script buddy that you would designate, we, everybody was reading, so you would, you had a script buddy who you would hand your script to and they would finish your part for you. So you could go off stage if you, if you needed to leave the stage. And on one of the performances, one of the women started weeping and she was looking across the stage at her script buddy and she, just didn't want to leave the stage and so we just the whole audience just waited and waited and then she got it together and she continued and it was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen an actor do she just would not leave the stage she just got it together and moved on it was great yeah <laughs> I'm curious, having these people from these opposite sides of such an intense conflict, what did the first day of rehearsal look like when everybody walked into the same room for the first time? Well, I was working, I was very lucky. I was working with people from American Friends Service Committee, which was um, the Quaker organization that's done peace work all over the world for many, many years. And, I've been working with them for a long time and I'm a big fan. I mean, I, I was uh, educated in Quaker schools and I, I love that faith and what it does, um, the kind of social work and human rights work it's always done. Um, so they were, there was this one guy, Jack, who was part of, he worked at the uh, American Friends Service Committee and he came to the first rehearsal 
And he's somebody who's gone into peacemaking situations over and over again all over the world. And he said, the thing you do is the first thing you do is you get people to just talk about something that's completely neutral and completely um, get there's no sort of big, uh, there's, there's a only, the association is only pleasure. And so he, he said, I think it was something like, what's your favorite dessert? And you go around the room and everybody, you know, cause that's something everybody can talk about without feeling like, you know, they're betraying themselves. The thing is that because we Americans, it was me, um, the psychiatric social worker, Sarah Lee Kahn, and Jack, the um, Quaker, we are all these Americans, we didn't know their language. And so we didn't know, and we didn't know the difference between their dialects betrayed them. You know, a Serb sounds different from a Croatian and Croatian sounds different from a Bosnian. And, and the, the suffixes on their um, names sort of gave away their ethnicities too. But, but we didn't know that. And so we were sort of blissfully unaware of all of these sort of tensions and uh, everything that were going on in, inside the cast. And I think that was a good thing that we were sort of stupid. And they could rely on that, you know, the, the Americans, they don't know what's really going on because when the fights developed and they did, um, I could go over and sort of say, what are you talking about? <laughs> and they'd have to take the time to like back up and translate. And in backing up and translating, sometimes they'd sort of end up laughing about how stupid it was, what they were fighting about. But even just the moment of sort of like, oh, the Americans here, let's, <laughs> we have to stop sniping at each other and uh, actually communicate. It was helpful. But they were also just remarkable people. I mean, these were people who were, they were new to the country. They were trying to find apartments. They were trying to raise their kids. They were trying to learn English. They were trying to find a job, you know, these one of them had been a judge and she was working as a chambermaid in a hotel and another had been a filmmaker and she was cleaning houses and you know these were people who were highly highly skilled in in their old world and they'd lost all of that and now they were in this really um you know scary and difficult country trying to get any job they could and in the middle of all of that they decide to come and do a reading <laughs> of a Greek play <laughs> with a bunch of people they didn't know who they knew were going to be from different sides of the conflict. I mean, it was amazing that we got anybody to do it at all. But we did because they said, we want to do something with our minds. You know, we want to address some of these issues through art. You know, we, we are so thirsty for something that is worth doing you know we didn't pay them we asked them to come and do rehearsals you know while they were while they could have been you know feeding their families we you know we didn't offer them anything but the experience itself and they still did it yeah it was remarkable I wish I could have been an audience member now. <laughs> so. I had a friend, I have a friend who's Yugoslavian. And so he knew all of the language that was happening. Mm -hmm. And he said, and he's an actor, a wonderful um, actor. And he said, watching it, I could, I could see their stories circling above their heads like butterflies all of their backstories because of course we never asked them what they'd been through sometimes we heard about it but we never asked them anything about their former lives we didn't never that was never part of the process because i didn't want to trigger them because they were all traumatized people they really it was the, the wounds were very raw psychologically and some of them actually had wounds i mean there was a guy who had lost his arm, one woman had lost her leg. I mean, it was very, very real. But we never asked them about um, 
the connotations of what they were, what, what was coming up for them because it was all too clear, you know, their connection with these, the material was incredibly deep. But you could see it in the way that they spoke, in the way that they did the parts, that they knew what they were talking about. They knew what war cost. And they all wanted that. It was, uh, the play was incredibly relevant for them. I mean, you, you've never seen anything like it in terms of like, these people were speaking from experience of being refugees, because they were. I love this show. <laughs> <laughs> now, we worked on it um, in a class of mine earlier this year. It's kind of how I was introduced to the anthology itself. And I think every single person in that class, there's nine of us, we're all women in it. We all just kind of sat there and we're like, this is amazing and I can't believe that it's actually a thing that's existed and we wish we could be in the audience. Our teacher was like, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like in our, so in acting four is the class she's in and we mostly focus on like Greek plays and um, Shakespeare, kind of like the older classical works. And I think during my time, we really focused on like the, classic Greeks like we didn't do any adaptations and so I really wish I was part of that class where you got to see adaptations um, to see kind of put into modern day context almost to see a different perspective of it um, mm. and so it's just it's incredible that you've taken these classic texts and brought a new light to them um, so people can continue to relate to them and find the and see the importance of those stories so I just thank you for that. Well, you thank think? you. I mean, I, th I, I like to think that I'm in the same tradition that the tragedians, the first tragedians were in, which is that they would take these stories, which, you know, for them, the Trojan War was as far distant from them as they are from us, you know. It's, that was old, old mythology for them. And, but they were taking those stories and doing variations on them, I mean, depending on what the, their times demanded. And so they'll do different versions of the same story, you know, at different times. And, but they're using those myths for their own purposes. And I just like to think that I'm doing the same thing that they were doing. Mm -hmm. That every person who's inspired by these Greek, uh, the original stories, is free to do that, that I'm not gonna do them any harm, you know. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the Greek guys will be fine. <laughs> they're just, they're gonna be done as long as people do plays, you know, I'm not gonna hurt them. And I think that, that it gives one a lot of freedom. But I also like the fact that the plays don't belong to anybody, they belong to us as human beings, you know. Mm -hmm. They're all about gods who haven't been worshipped for thousands of years. They're all about, you know, these these myths that are as old as human beings are, you know. And even if you don't know the myths, you know the myths because they make, they resonate, they make sense. You know, they're stories that just simply make sense because they're human stories. And I find that very freeing. Mm -hmm. And just speaking as a playwright who's always had some difficulty with structure, it's nice to know that you can just sort of like, oh, here's a structure and I can just lay <laughs> you get to work with this onto thing. it and it'll hold, you know. Yeah. Right and true. <laughs> That's like the thing that I, whenever I try to write anything, I think structure is the hardest thing I have an issue with is laying something out and yeah. creating a Okay, you gotta, I gotta get it. You gotta add the fly. You got your rising action. You got your climax. And with the Greeks, it's all there for you. Yeah, yeah. And it means that you can take huge liberties, because I do. And it's still there underneath. So, is there a Greek play that you would want to readapt? Is there another one? You know, I 
think I'm done. You're done. Okay. I did, I, I did. It's now I've done um, seventeen now. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and I think I'm done. I I had the extraordinary uh, privilege of doing a version of Aeschylus is the Oresteia. Mm -hmm. And I did that last year for the Washington uh, Shakespeare Theater. And um, it was a really extraordinary production directed by Michael Kahn, who is, he was, he was the artistic director there for 37 years. He founded mm -hmm. the theater company and he left uh, this summer, last summer. And it was the last thing he directed in his theater. And I was really proud of it, I think, you know, and those are the sort of, that's the only trilogy that we have, the only existing trilogy. And it's, they are among the oldest plays that we have, and they are just uh, inescapably extraordinary plays. And I just think, well, it's not like I'm going to do better than that. <laughs> you know, maybe I should go out <laughs> on a I know. There you go. I was like, that, that's, I think, as good as I can do. You know? um, but I mean, they'll always be part of me because they're just, they are, you know. They're... But I think in terms of like, oh, that's a play I've always wanted to get to. I don't think I have that feeling about any of the rest of them. Mm -hmm. The ones that I haven't done, I'm, I'm sort of like, Medea, I don't need to do a Medea. <laughs> I've never been able to figure out what to do with Medea. I mean, she kills the kids. I mean, what do you do about that? I just, I, ca I can't find a way into that one. She, Fair enough. She's a tough character. I did, Mary Zimmerman um, has a show called Argonautica um, mm -hmm. that uh, both of us have had, actually had the privilege of being in. And I had the, I had the play Medea and it's, she's one of the toughest characters I've ever had to try to figure yeah. out because you have to figure out in, in her mind, justifying killing her kids is the only answer to get what she wants. And yeah. And I mean, I can, I, I understand it intellectually, mm -hmm. but I don't want to touch that. It, yeah. I feel like it speaks for itself, like for what it is. And yeah. It's, 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 and I've never seen a production where I thought, oh, go Medea, you know, <laughs> I've never seen a production where I was like anything other than like, okay. <laughs> um, but I've, I've taken on Clytemnestra several times now, and I, I find her, you know, horrifying, but also quite readable. I, I understand what she's doing and why she does it. I became familiar with the Oresteia my freshman year of college, just four years ago. Um, and one of, it was in a class for classics and one of the um, assignments was a scene from it. So we took, we did a scene from Agamemnon and we did it in a devised manner for an English class. It was three mm -hmm. years old. Everybody else looked at us like we were insane because they just sat there and read the text. Um, but we Don't like to that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just, it's just the trilogy is just incredible. And last year, I became reacquainted with it because I did a Clytemnestra monologue for um, an audition. So I re re read through it, and just like yours, like that character itself is so complex and so intriguing, and like the reasons that she does things is not like I feel like it's hard to dislike her but also hard to like her completely because you you do tend to understand the logic behind what she's doing though you don't always morally agree with it yeah and we can't morally agree with her I mean let's face it uh, best will in the world we cannot agree with it but there is some way in which she makes sense to me. Even emotionally, she makes sense to me. And I've, I've enjoyed investigating her. So, kind of on a slightly different, different note, 
um, when I was reading Iphigenia and Other Daughters, you mentioned in the character description of, I'm going to butcher this name, have to look at it, Christ, Christ though. Oh, Chrysothemus. Thank you. Chrysothemus. Chrysothemus, yeah. Um, that she is like this voice that you know, a lot of women have. I agree with this saying that you, what do you think you're doing? You're, why do you think you're so important? You're just a girl. You can't um, possibly know what consequences are, all of those kinds of things. Um, and I do think that is very relevant. It's something that we fight against every day, especially as women. And I was kind of wondering what are the things that you do to kind of combat that voice that's constantly in the back of your head? Yeah, well, that voice has been very active all of my life, I'm sorry to say. Um, the belittling, the belittling voice, the voice that basically is the voice of, you know, we could call it the voice of the patriarchy, but really it's the voice that um, has always been there to tell um, women in particular, just shut up and stop stop aspiring to big things to saying big things to any ambitions outside of home and family um because you don't know enough and you don't and you'll never have experienced enough and you shouldn't be in the room with the 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 big boys who, who are going to make the decisions and who run the world and it's still, I'm sorry to say, just as much. Um, a, I, I'm, I'm, I hope and I assume that it's not as bad for your generation as it was for mine, but um, it's still obviously uh, as real as it's ever been. And I think the Me Too movement is going to do uh, good things in t just in terms of women's solidarity with each other and knowing that we don't have to endure these things privately and in, in shame and dark corners. Now we can actually reach out for support from at least other women, if not other men. But I think there are a lot of men who are actually coming into a real understanding of what um, women have been up against for a long time. But that said, again, that's still an intellectual realization. And for me, it's, uh, it's taking a long time for it to be um, a fully integrated realization that I have a right to speak my own truth and I have a right to speak about large things and important things. And it would have helped in so many ways if, you know, we had a female president right now um, who was actually in control of the most powerful nation on earth. Um, and who could be handling, um, oh, everything better. But um, that would have, I think, been a great thing for the world, but it would have been a great thing for us as women in America. And the fact that there are no longer um, any female candidates in the running is disappointing, but actually not all that surprising since I think all of us got so burned by the last election and are still basically reeling from that. But I would like to see a female president, um, a democratic female president in my lifetime. Um, and that may not happen. I mean, I, I don't know, but uh, it sure would be nice. Um, in the meantime, we have these extraordinary figures who were not around back in when I was your age. We have, you know, the Elizabeth Warrens and the AOCs and, you know, these amazing figures who are, um, I think, great, great leaders. And that will make a difference on every level in a good way. And I think we have, you know, back, back when I was your age, um, we didn't have many female playwrights. We didn't have many, you know, strong figures in the American theater who were female. And now that is really not the case. I mean, now I think we're really coming into our own and we will eventually catch up to, to the point where there'll be as many um, 
plays written by women is produced in this country as there are plays written by men and it'll be half and half as it should be and hasn't ever been. Um, I, I really do have faith that that will happen eventually. But still, you know, we're, we're at something of a disadvantage in that there's always that voice just saying, you know, shut up. <laughs> what do you know? And uh, don't even try to address the big stuff because it's not for you, honey, you know. And I, that's a voice that I really, I, I gave articulate form with Chrysophemus, and she's, for me, the hardest voice to dismiss in that play. The one who says, well, you, you did nothing to Electra, you know, which is technically true. Electra did nothing. She just sort of happened to be in the yard and sort of pointed him the way to the front door. But he was always going to have to do what he does. And for her to say, no, I'm the center of this event, it's just not true. And that's, this, that's the thing that she cannot, that, that Electra cannot bear to hear. But it also is the truth. And it, that, that I love, is that there's the, 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 these two truths that are, both of them are right. You know, she says, no, I, without me, nothing would have happened, you know. Well, no. <laughs> um, so, well, it's just, it's so interesting um, being, like, I'm, what, 22 years old, graduating college, female, and, like, seeing the trajectory that women have taken in the past, I don't know, 15 years um, with the Me Too movement and really starting to take their space, which is something I think that has not been encouraged prior to. Um, I've been going to, I've been lucky enough to go to Women on Broadway the past two years um, and see all these really incredible women who I, most of which I'd never heard of before, but whether or not I know them prior to going to, I'm not going to ever forget them after. And they push me to kind of take my own space. And I think that we all do have that little voice in our head saying, no, you're not good enough for this. You, you don't carry the, what is it, the big stick or whatever it's called. Um, well, I mean, th that on top of what the theater business does to us, which is to say, eh, you know, stay home. You don't even try yeah. because it's just too hard and you're just not talented enough or what, you're not pretty enough or you're not... Blah, 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 blah. That combined with the things that women are always telling themselves anyway, it's a really toxic brew and we just have to do everything we can to stay focused on like, no, this is actually what I feel and what I believe and what I know is the truth. Mm -hmm. and I'm gonna speak that truth and I'm going to pursue whatever potential I have and do with it what I can. And it doesn't matter if you don't like me, you know, if I walked out of that audition and I sucked. <laughs> You know, we've all had that experience. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's a business that eats its own. It's a very cruel thing. And, you know, it's so I think that's part of the reason that we're so attuned to the warmth that it also generates, which is unlike anything that I've ever experienced in any other, um, you know, venue or profession. There is this incredible um, capability of theater people to connect and to uh, do right, right by each other and really understand what's important here and what's worth defending and what's worth doing. And that's why I love theater people. But it is not an easy, it's not an easy profession if you 
have a thin skin and who doesn't have a thin skin? I mean, in order to do what we do, you have to have a thin skin. You have to be able to go really deep, really sincerely and have people say, no, that's not good enough. Thank you very much. Go home. You know? <laughs> so I don't know. It takes an extraordinary person to be able to just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Stay in it. And it also takes a certain amount of luck and it's wonderful to find friends for life. And I've made friends in college who I'm still working with and I'm still in touch with. I mean, the people that have really made a difference in my career are the people that I met at the very beginning <clears throat> of that career. I mean, Tony and I knew each other when we were just starting out and we're still, you know, he's, still very close and you know the people that matter are the people that mattered then so i think it's great you guys have each other that's that's going to serve you well for the rest of your life and just know that it's the circle of people that you're building right now who are going to be um you know the circle that will that will sustain you through your life I just had a like a Zoom cocktail hour, you know, quarantinis is what we call it. I love that. <laughs> With one of my oldest friends who was my roommate in college. And she's still in the theater and we're still doing our thing. I love yeah. that. Yeah. So you just, uh, that's, that's, I mean, these friendships that we make in this medium in particular uh, you have to trust them because they're going to get you through the hard times. Mm -hmm. And you'll continue to inspire each other for the rest of your lives. This is all really fun and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we don't want to keep taking up too, too much of your time. Um, we well, just didn't know, uh, is there anything you're working on now that we can kind of that people know about? Um, well, you know the play that I was saying? Yes. I wrote on spec um, that it hasn't been produced yet. There may be, depending on whether the world opens up a little bit in the fall, there may be a production of it that we're going to do a workshop of at Montclair University. Yeah, in New Jersey. And, and then there'll be a production, a full production in, um, in the spring. And that would be a wonderful thing, but I'm not holding my breath since everything that I've been relying on, all of my gigs for the next six months have been canceled. So mm -hmm. I'm not um, assuming anything. Because uh, I do think that the, the coronavirus is now running the world, so. It's calling the shots, and we'll see what we can what we can get away with. But I wish you all the best. Thank you so much for your time and just talking with us. Sure. Thanks for doing the play.